Hey, thanks for joining us. Um, we are coming to you from Manage Solution, a team of experts in your business IT. And I am very excited to have Sean Farrell here with me today, our CEO. Sean, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, of course. Um, so just to introduce you for people who don't know you, um, Sean lives here in San Diego. Um, he is a husband and father of two beautiful boys, which I'm sure you have pictures of back there. Beautiful and crazy, but they are. <laughs> and homeschooled right now. That must be really fun. <laughs> must be a blast. I've heard. I've heard from all the parents. Yes. They're, they're send. I give lots of credit to all the parents during COVID. Um, and Sean, you graduated from University of San Diego in 2000. Mm -hmm. And then you started Managed Solution in 2002, right? Yeah, I took a quick stint. I didn't actually do any. should have traveled. Anybody out there in college, go travel, go do something first. But I got offered some jobs around some different areas. Um, was a background in law and philosophy and then business information systems. And I decided about a year and a half in to start Managed Solutions. So yeah, very quick right after school. Nice. What had you, I know your story, but just to share a tiny little bit about your story of just starting Managed Solution would be great. Yeah, sure. You know, it was... I honestly saw, I was in the tech sector working in the healthcare kind of segment of the tech sector, meeting all these really cool people who were really techy, so to speak, back then. And that back then it was very different, but I just met them, you know, we bonded in, in, in terms of just, I loved listening to them talk about the tech stuff and what they were doing and more so like the business they were working at, um, especially back then in biotech. It was just so new to me, learning a lot about what was going on in that world. So became fast friends, a bunch of these people. And I went out and said, you know what, I'll go out and walk the street. I, I still, no, I didn't live in my dorm, of course, because I graduated. I lived in an apartment with some college roommates that had stuck with me. And so hired one who lived on my couch. I told him, you know, if you want to pay rent, you can, you can come in and help what quote unquote cold call back then. And I walked buildings and had, um, you know, just tried to tell people we could help them around, you know, what they were doing with technology. And like I say, back then it was, you had a computer and you had a server to put your data on and you could print and all that good stuff, but it was just a scary thing, you know, looking at those no soliciting signs and mm -hmm. running into buildings and all that going, what's going to come at me. And then it was interesting too, because there was a lot of times I'd walk in and I'd leave and somebody would say, wait, before you go, can I talk to you for a minute? I want to introduce you to, you know, our CFO. And it was like, wow, this was, it was, so it was exciting. It was I always joke, I think business is like playing like a sport in some ways. It's a game and, you know, I'm, I'm competitive. You know, I played college sports and all that. And I wanted to win. So that was the fun part, but it was to, to this day that the, honestly, I say this out loud. I mean, I'd still, I love the people. Like I just love being in the services business. So that's, that's my passion. Well, one thing that I was going to say is that uh, for 10 years in a row, Managed Solution has been recognized as one of the fastest growing companies in San Diego. Um, we'll see for, for this year, you know, with everything going on, um, it might still, might still make it right. And, um, and also, you know, me being a relatively new employee, I can speak to the culture and say that like literally, even from the interview process, I fell in love with the team pretty much right away. And I still am more and more all the time. And I'm so grateful for that. And I know that you are so all about people. You give them and us all the credit and it, it is about us, but it also stems from the top. So I did want to say that as far as like you as a leader, um, it's, it's pretty phenomenal and I'm really grateful to be on the team. Thank you. Yeah, and I think I'll make, I'll make a comment. Like I, I remember for years, people would say, is it like you guys like run like a family business. Is it a family business? I had a family member or members working for us. And the reality was it wasn't, um, it was a business, but I do, the more I thought about it over the years, the more I, I think I wrote everybody in our company a letter a few weeks ago, you know, running a business is a lot like having a family, you know, it's all about, you know, people trusting and feeling safe and feeling open to having a conversation with you. Um, so as funny as that sounds where people say, you know, we're not a family business or in any walk of life, I think we all are in some ways. So anyway, it is near and dear to my heart. I do spend a lot of time behind the scenes talking to our senior leadership team about what we can do for our people. And then of course I spend even more time with that talking about our people and then how they serve our customers. And we do that all the time. And so it's, it's a, but it's a, it's a moving target. It's always changing as things change in the, in the world of business. Absolutely. A hundred percent. So something I wanted to talk about is you started the company right after the dot-com bubble burst and Managed Solution was also around during the market crash of 2008. 
And now we're going through this COVID pandemic. So you've managed to get through and even grow from tough times. Yeah. Well, <laughs> ignorance is bliss, as they say, I suppose, <laughs> back then. I think I was, what, 20, probably 23, maybe 24, when that first dot-com thing came up. But I mean, at that time, again, I, I just saw this great article about, um, in COVID right now, this concept around this restaurateur who's thinking about right now exploding, even mm -hmm. though technically they're not really open yet. And so he was talking about when there's a forest fire out there and all these trees sort of burn down, those seedlings, those sprouting companies are ultimately, you know, give them a little water and they'll grow. And so that was always my mindset back then was, um, you know, sort of ignore all of the, the negative stuff and really, you know, seize the opportunity when it's there. And so during that time, we did um, really well trying to just adapt to what the environment, you know, had kind of put around us. So a lot of people were worried about things stopping in the year 2000. Um, and so we were trying to figure out, well, how do we make sure we kept everybody's stuff and data and all that? And then 2008, the market, you know, when the housing crisis and all that came up, Mm -hmm. Again, we had to find our niches, um, you, know, you know, when real estate was down and, and lenders and, you know, banks were struggling and all that stuff. And we're in finance, as you know, we were looking at other companies who were thriving, you know, and say biotech and health, healthcare was big back then and still is big and just trying to adapt. But I got to say, I mean, even during that time, it was still about, you know, trying to when the market's down and people are available, and I hate to say this, and I mean it in the best of ways, when there are people out there looking for jobs, when the market's not, you know, the unemployment rates, you know, higher at certain times, we go out and we source the best people. But again, I've always joked, like, and I st say this to this day, sourcing people now and keeping people through having great culture in the future is going to be the key to every business's success because um, it's hard to keep people as, you know, markets are good and people move around. And then with COVID, um, gosh, same thing. I mean, you know, we just, for us, I was terrified as I think anybody was, you know, that comment, you know, fear, uncertainty, doubt, FUD. Yeah. Um, and that definition of fear, right? It causes uncertainty and you're trying to figure out what to do. And I've always said, I have to figure it out in my head first. How am I going to navigate through this and steer that ship? And then, you know, people internally have to figure out, you know, what does this all mean to me and to manage solution? And I hope they're looking at both their family and of course their business. But, you know, it was interesting. We adapted quick. We, our help desk has taken off, which has been awesome because now the traditional IT guy who works on site can't run out to a place of somebody's home and we can take the calls remotely or, you know, co collaboration, all that stuff's became not different because we've been doing conferencing and all that stuff for a while, but now we're really having to do it. I'm really having to see people on a video versus just them calling into those audio bridges. And and I would say last but not least, you know, I'm, I'm terrified about how companies get a affected from the internet from a cybersecurity perspective. So security is a big topic and it's been coming up an awful lot. But yeah, I mean, it's just adapting to the times. Yeah, it's adapting and, you know, being within the organization, it, it was interesting to see all those changes happening so quickly. Um, and it like, it, it, I feel like I'm so, I'm so proud personally to be part of the company that acts that fast, you know, to, to support the company as a whole, right? Because that's, that's, everybody wants that. We all want to come out of this on top and better, right? So um, the people are one part of the company, and that is huge. And we just talked a lot about that. Uh, you and our team are technology experts, business technology experts. And I would say that right now in the context, especially of COVID, where, like you just said, we're using video conferencing more than ever, um, companies are having to rely on technology more than ever. And it's this, you know, this invisible thing that their company actually sits on and functions on that a lot of leaders don't actually take the time to really fully understand. Some people do, I mean, mm -hmm. some don't. Um, people are working from home. There's a diminished or there's discussion of a diminished sense of maybe community and, you know, leadership control over the company. I think a lot is changing right now. People are starting to see how employees actually do behave, right, when they're at home. And I think there's a pleasant surprise there where people are actually really on top of things for, you know, in a lot of cases. Um, but I want to ask you, what must leaders be paying attention to right now in terms of tech um, to keep the culture and the company alive through this process? Sure, sure. Well, you know, and, and I think at the very front end of that question, it's just, you know, CEO, CXO, just leaders in every organization right now. I mean, I do think that as much as I hated to say it back then and being those guys in the dark closet, you know, tech was something of an afterthought. I think it's front and center now. Um, 
And leaders are trying to figure out, you know, how do I drive culture in my company, even from afar? Um, and what does that mean to drive culture? Does that mean doing fun activities and trying to have those Friday night happy hours over a, a Microsoft Teams or a Zoom meeting? Or, or does that mean, you know, trying to communicate to them in a different way? So, you know, I think they're finding new ways to do that through some of the tools that are out there, you know, you know, do, do some of these live broadcasts, you know, being more open with their employees. I, I would say from a human perspective, you know, the tech is the way we communicate that to, through and to them. And again, I still think there's some challenges in that because we keep talking about internally around, there's nothing better than sitting in a room face to face with somebody and just understanding and feeling the warmth, the trust, you know, all those things that are inherent in people that we need to have, frankly, I don't think technology is going to necessarily solve that. Agreed. Um, but we need to have that. So that's a challenge. But to combat that challenge, you know, for the for me, at least, and I think I hope for all the CEOs out there and, and leaders, it's just all about, you know, always being curious, trying to understand what's going on, not overreacting, and then, you know, doing everything with a lot of humility, just, you know, trying to get understand not only what you're feeling, but what everybody in your organization is feeling. And I, I tell my wife and my kids and everybody who's, you know, even here at home, I say, you know, when I go out in public now a little bit, when I say public, go to the store to get the food and all that good stuff, I just don't pretend to know like how everybody else is feeling, you know, because I don't. I don't know if somebody's been laid off or if they're stressed at work or if they're financially in trouble. I just don't know if they're having a problem in their family. So for me, it's like treat everybody with kindness and, um, you know, just and for and I, I'm a lifelong learner. Like I said earlier, it's like if I could do two things in life, it would be always be humble and always be curious. Like those are those are the two traits I want to continue to have as a, as a human. So I think CEOs need to bring that back to work if they're not already doing that. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Thanks for, for sharing that. And, um, and then going from to a tech perspective, like technology, tech <laughs> on the technology side. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What the should leaders be paying attention to uh, close attention to now that can help them get through this and actually grow from what's going on? Yeah, sorry, I was I love the human side. But I know. <laughs> I like tech side too. Okay. So um oh gosh. So there's been a huge evolution in technology, you know, and we can talk more about that. But ultimately, um at a very high level right now, I do think the CXOs of the world are very connected to their tech. They understand, you know, how it could be impactful to them. But some of the things I think they're missing, or I think we're all missing as a community, is for the for many years we've kind of came up and we've had myself included, our IT people have their favorites and who they want to, you know, work with from a technology manufacturing perspective, you know, whether it was the big boys, the Microsofts, the Dells, the, the Cisco's, the AWS's or Amazon's. But really right now, I think what CEOs need to be thinking about is, you know, I've collected all this data inside of my organization over these years, you know, people are putting more and more in, we've transitioned from what once was paper to everything's digitized, or at least it probably should be. And I want to understand how to automate things in my business, whether it's just what we're doing and working from a remote, you know, how do I automate processes? So I, since I can't run down the hall and see the human too, how do I, you know, take all that great data that I've kind of put into a system and get some of the intelligence out of it? Uh, and we've heard the term BI, it's not complex at all. It's really just taking disparate sets of data, clumping it all together, and then getting it spit out the other side to be able to give you, you know, ways to run your business in the future. And they talk about this. It's not me in many articles and in many um, uh, publications that are going on right now that if you don't have the intelligence coming out of your data to run your business now, it's going to be a struggle in the future. So I can't stress enough and, you know, business intelligence and how do you get there? You know, it's all about quote unquote aggregating that data somewhere. So as much as we all struggle with the concept of the cloud out there and make fun of it and all that good stuff and think it's more expensive, I always ask the question to CEOs, is it more expensive if I could quickly move and aggregate all your data to one place? And you may pay a little bit more than you would for, say, something on-premise, so to speak, which, by the way, it's hard to get to our on-premise stuff right now, mm -hmm. and then be able to quickly just use, you know, and again, I'll use these terms, machine learning and artificial intelligence, these servers in the cloud sort of do that for you and then you get these really unique dashboards to point you in the right direction steer that ship and i mean i'll tell you even through this COVID thing i've heavily relied on you know in all our tools are integrated into one our crm tools with our ticketing tools to be able to make good decisions on you know hiring which again is spit out through sort of a financial you know story that we tell mm -hmm. but anyway so so that's where i think that's important there 
collaborative tools, I think you need to pick your poison. Um, you know, we're all have got hung up on conferencing lately. Um, and I think a lot of companies are going, well, I have a conferencing tool, but I have my data over here. When I say data, just, you know, my files, the stuff I need access to every day. Do we, you know, really build that into one, what we call hub for work. And that's, that's becoming very popular. So as much as we do Microsoft technology and Amazon stuff, but you know, Microsoft does a great job with teams. Um, you know, we've integrated Zoom with Teams, we've integrated Cisco with Teams. Slack is a similar product in the market, you know, who has kind of this, what we call waterfall of communication, you know, chat and all that good stuff where you can put all your documents. Um, but again, chat still needs the voice piece. So, I mean, again, I don't want to tout Microsoft too much, but I think they're doing a good job there. I think Google's going to continue to come up in the world for the business. So, so collaboration tools. And then the third thing they need to think about, and I can't stress this enough and I feel so guilty talking about it because I don't ever want to come across in any way salesy but security as boring as it, it sounds it is more prevalent than ever and not because companies well one is companies are getting for, you know forced more into compliance I mean it's just happening and we're seeing it all over the place with our government agencies and our health cares and our pharmas but more so um, all this stuff we're doing what we're doing right now um, this is where these, what we call actors, they call them hackers, if you want to say it that way. This is where these people are coming in and, you know, grabbing our profile, grabbing our passwords. I mean, they're spoofing or, you know, copying phones right now where we supposedly get our second factor of authentication. Mm -hmm. So it's just not a topic talked about enough because it's not something that to the CEO makes them more productive. Yeah. Um, but yet when you're not productive because you got breached and we had, you know, a recent one where we saw $250,000 for one user clicking on a, an email, they had to pay it in Bitcoin as we're hearing about. And it's just, it, it brought a company to its standstill. So, you know, those are the three things I'd think about. Actually, it's funny because I was on a sales call a couple of days ago and, um, our team did a simulated attack for a company and it was, they think it was their CEO who clicked on it. <laughs> So we did a simulation of what you're talking about where um, those bad actors are, uh, you know, sending uh, phishing emails and um, you never know who's going to click on it. And they're really, they're getting more and more tricky these days and um, easier to fall for. Yeah. They're super fun. Those simulated phishing attacks, just like they sound. And, and yeah, I mean the CEO and the CFO and the one, those are the ones who people want to get yeah. into the most. And so, and I mean, believe me, I've, you know, goodness gracious, we've seen stuff come across my desk or my email or my chat that have been, they look really legitimate. And of course, our system will warn us this looks like it could be a potential threat. But yeah, it's pretty amazing what they've been able to do. Yeah, it's it is. Bad and you people. Talked a, oh, sorry, go ahead. I just said these bad people trying to do it. Yeah. Um, you talked a little bit about data and making business decisions from data. And I know you and I have talked a little bit about that. Um, and we even have you know, our own uh, case study for that going through COVID and you making decisions from the data that you were seeing. And we talked a little bit about good data versus bad data. So I'm just curious, can you share with um, everyone, what does good data mean? What does bad data mean? Can you maybe share some examples? Um, and you know, if you maybe can share a little bit about some decisions that you've made from the data that you've seen, just to give people a, an example of, you know, sure. what we do, yeah. yeah. And I'll use the other side of good data, bad data, garbage in, garbage out, as they say, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. So, you know, I, where, let me give you an example in our world. Um, you know, we operate a services company and service is all based on how quickly we can respond to something. Um, you know, de defining the severity of something that comes in, making sure that it's like being in a hospital, being a doctor. I mean, how, you know, how about a, how about a shape is this patient in? And so they go through and their electronic medical record systems and ultimately put a lot of that information in about the patient. So same with us, we put information in about our patient, our people uh, that are calling in. And what I, what I would say to that is that as we went through, the beginning stages of COVID and we looked at our help desk and we started looking at, oh goodness gracious, you know, we're getting calls now 24 hours a day. You know, we have a 24 by seven help desk, but these things are coming in at 6 p.m., 8 p.m. But the type of calls in specific that are coming in, um, you know, remember a human being answers our phone every single time and they've got to put that data in the system to say, you know, this client called in, they say their whole network is down. So they put a ticket in by that type or service type and if that data is accurate, I can then better, and what we ended up doing, figure out one, how to staff employees for one, figure out what level of employee I'm trying to hire for for two. And ultimately, you know, it was the data that we were feeding into the system, which again, if it wasn't good data, so we were really coaching our people, 
on making sure those calls are logged the right way mm -hmm. so that you know when we came back to them or we wanted to get the business intelligence out of the other end to make good hiring and financial decisions frankly we could do that um so that's i mean one of many examples another one as far as garbage in garbage out has been you know, on the, on the sales side, I mean, like any company, I mean, you know, there's kind of three walks of life in every business. There's revenue. I mean, however you want to look at revenue, marketing, sales, top of the funnel, all that good stuff. There's sort of that operational component of a business, making sure mm -hmm. that it, you know, operationally delivers that product or service it, it, you know, puts out there. And then there's the whole collect, the, what I call the um, accountability piece. So that's accounting, that's administrative, that's just keeping things, um, you know, reporting, and that's 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 kind of the third leg, and you can have many people doing many positions inside of that. But back to the sales side of it, you know, we were trying to figure out, you know, with COVID, what does our sales pipeline look like? How, how is it shifting, frankly, from you know, mm -hmm. big businesses who we do projects with that have went home for a while, who have kind of stopped those projects to, you know, then those engineering teams who do a lot of those projects. Do I shift their roles into helping more? on the help desk potentially during this COVID um, uh, situation. So if the data going into our CRM system, again, by a human, the salesperson who's doing that magic, you know, I call them the artists, um, as you guys know, that the CRM is just the science. Um, mm -hmm. If that's data is going in there and it's not being put in right and the type of product or project it is or the type of service we're going to provide isn't right, then we're going to have our HR team recruiting for the wrong people or potentially be staffing people in the wrong area. So again, Data is gold. Yeah, which is so critical at this time, especially. Um, thanks for sharing that. And one other thing I wanted to bring up is that, you know, especially on the sales side of things, which, you know, I'm familiar with, something that I've experienced is that even people who are professionals in tech or who understand it really well, um, nobody really has the bandwidth to understand everything. Nobody has the time to become an expert in all the options so that they can pick one in that way. Um, and so what a lot of people end up doing is picking something that they're comfortable with, something that they just know from the past. And we see a lot of kind of piecemeal um, environments where they're using you know, one type of software for this, one type of software for that. Like you said before, you might be using um, one for video conferencing and a totally separate one for, uh, you know, uh, I am, you know, chatting, yeah. but I call the virtual water cooler <laughs> or the virtual head poke over the desk. Yes. And, uh, and so, you know, there's, um, there may be, there are benefits to that, right? People, they know their environment, they know what it is and, and they're familiar with it. And then there are also costs to it on the other side that we've been seeing. And I think that this all ties in, right? Training people to put in good data, um, picking the right integrated system and being integrated also in my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, it means oftentimes more secure. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what are the, um, the pitfalls and the benefits maybe of doing that, sticking to what you know versus being willing to explore something new and um, making things a little tighter. Yeah, well, and I can't stress enough, um, you know, for years, I mean, you know, 15 years, 16 years of doing this, you know, back, at the beginning stages, people were so interested in, you know, think about IT people, the IT guy, poor gal, you know, you think about them, they had their favorites, you know, I love, oh goodness, I love my Microsoft, I love my Dell computer, I love my HP people, Sony's cool, like everybody had these products that they were such big fans of. And, you know, in my world, as I've grown up through technology, I've been really looking more at, you know, integration, how do we do things more holistically, you know, how do I think about technology, almost like my people who work in my business, you know, every one of them has a role and those roles have to integrate well. And, and the best businesses are operationally excellent in what they do. I mean, their processes are just spot on. And so when you start thinking about what happened with technology, I mean, we started seeing, goodness gracious, phone systems who were doing one thing over here so you could answer a call, CRM tools over here. So you had to make a call on the CRM, on the phone system, but the CRM, you'd have to log in information. Mm -hmm. um, bring it to current day, you know, you started seeing things like, um, you know, Word and Excel and all your office documents in one place over here that you're saving to a file drive. But again, getting that information, again, back to the people and getting that information from the people to the customers became more and more difficult because we had so many disparate tools based upon, I like the manufacturer, the product, the vendor, versus I'm not looking at the business and the process and really what we need to be successful. 
So my advice, which I can't stress enough right now, is that a lot of these big vendors, these big manufacturers out there in the software space are sort of building a lot of these tools into their own platforms, building them so they integrate better together, becoming more agnostic, if you will. So can my Apple computer or my iPad or whatever work within my Microsoft platform, or can my Google Chromebook work within my Office 365 platform? But again, really thinking beyond just the hardware, the tools, and thinking about the solution and the, and the process, yes, the answer is yes. And I think CEOs and their IT people need to start thinking more like that. Um, and not getting so hung up on the tools and the products, but really on what is the the, the, the outcome and what are the businesses trying to achieve. And, and those CEOs, and I start to call him, you know, I even have a friend who's a chief information administrative officer, you know, he's kind of thrown an A in there. Um, he's all about the processes and that's the smart way to look at things. So that's where you need to look into the future with technology. And the cloud has enabled a lot of that. I mean, I hate to say it, but you know, once you've sort of positioned that data in that cloud, a lot of those tools that we talk about are hooked in. So whether it's the phone that you use to make a call or the, you said the chat or the instant message or the documents, they're right there at your disposal, but all tightly integrated. And that's going to be the key for the future. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, that's what I see because I even, I compare my, even my at home experience to my office experience and the office is so much more pleasant to use. And I use Mac on one and Windows on another, and I'm not all about either. I'm just all about the end user experience and my experience, you know, with all of it, sharing my own files. Like I do just as much sharing personally as I do professionally. So yep. it's an, an amazing learning experience for me to see what, you know, what we use internally um, and talk to uh, the people that we work with and learn what they're using, what they're doing, what their struggles are, what their um, successes are. Um, and it's just, it's just been a really fun experience to um, see all the different opportunities with technology. Yeah. And I can't, I'll say one thing to the, I mean, you, I mean, the user, um, you know, there's definitely a, a gap, so to speak, in consumption of technology right now. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is this, there's actually a book about it called The Consumption Gap. But, you know, technology features and functionality and let's just say, we'll use Microsoft Excel. Oh my goodness, you probably have no idea the average Excel user, all the cool stuff you can do inside of it. But as a user, keeping up with those features is virtually impossible. And that's, you know, one of many applications you probably have access to. If you're CRM companies who use Salesforce or, or Microsoft or HubSpot for marketing, I mean, there's just so many cool things these things, these platforms can do. And that's okay. We don't expect the users to necessarily keep up with everything. But my opinion on where things are going in the tech industry is this. So if you're inside a company and you're in tech or you're us outsourcing tech to companies, I think, and what we're positioning our help desk to do and our people is to drive the end user experience. Like how, how do we do more training? How do we tell people, frankly, even though this is a good product in market right now, it may not be right for you guys because the user adoption is key. Mm -hmm. And unless your users, you know, I always say old habits die hard unless your users are willing to adopt that new technology. And, you know, we love to train. We love to, we do weekly webinars. Unless they're willing to do it, it's going to be an uphill battle. And when somebody doesn't adopt a platform that you put in that was very expensive, it fails. And that's no fun for the business. Or it, or it just stalls the business out for a time because you're so focused on that. So, you know, I think help desks like we run, I think internal help desks at companies, I think we're going to see in IT people really looking at business process. And then if I'm going to implement something new for the user, how do we make sure the experience and the adoption is great? That's where I think it's going to go. Yeah. Um, nailed it. That's, that's been my experience, just enjoying using it. So, um, Sean, thank you so much for taking this time. Is there anything else that you want to leave everyone with before we end this um, interview? No, I hope they make robots that do haircuts soon. Um, <laughs> can come to your house and you don't have, you can disinfect them with Lysol. But other than that, no, I appreciate it. And, and anything I can share with anybody, just, you know, always let me know. I will say I gave my first COVID cut. Okay. I gave a great haircut. It was, I, I'm very proud. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if, it, yeah, there was a product called the Flowbe years ago I heard about that might be coming back, but that's another, that's a Interesting. Long, long story. So. Okay. Thank you Thank so, you so, so much. Here. Of course. Thanks, Jess. We'll see you soon. Um, if you guys like this uh, this topic, if this is interesting to you or beneficial for you, please go ahead and follow. You can follow Managed Solution, myself, Sean, connect with us um, wherever you're watching this, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Bye, guys.